There is no practical obstacle whatever now to the creation of an efficient index to all human knowledge, ideas and achievements. To the creation, that is, of a complete planetary memory for all mankind. He was one of the early inventors of, of science fiction. The idea of time travel, the possibility of invisibility, <laughs> of intergalactic struggles. And then he came up with ideas of how we might reorganize the knowledge apparatus of the world, which he called the world brain. For Wells, the world brain had to contain all that was learnt and known, and that was being learnt and known. If you have access to anything that's been written, not just theoretical access, but like instant access next to your brain, that changes your idea of who you are. It can be reproduced exactly and fully in Peru, China, Iceland, Central Africa, or wherever else. They were frank in their ambition and dazzling in their ability to execute it. The Google Book Scanning Project is clearly the most ambitious world brain scheme that has ever been invented. This is no remote dream, no fantasy. It is a plain statement of a contemporary state of affairs. There will be a great danger to ce that Google is the monopoly of this ambition. The nightmare scenario in 20 years' time would be Google tracking everything we read. Google could basically hold the whole world hostage. Ever since Wells, Science fiction is always about the possibility that people don't really matter in the future, and the plot is always about some heroic person that either succeeds or doesn't succeed in proving that people really matter after all. It's a library, a public library where people go to look at books and read them and take them away. That girl works at the library and she checks on books that are going out and books that are coming back in. I love libraries. I like the smell, uh, the smell of paper properly preserved. It's as if it's the smell of a hay barn that's been uh, cleared of all its animals and made into human intelligence. And in a library, you, you really, even if you're sitting in the tea room discussing your latest findings. It's amazing how much social interaction with other people will actually help you to enrich what you're doing. In this part of the library, the grown-ups can read the stories to the children. People sometimes say to me, aren't libraries obsolete? Um, it's, it's absurd. They are nerve centers, centers of intellectual energy. Libraries stand for an ideal, which is an educated public. And to the degree that knowledge is power, they also stand, therefore, for the idea that uh, power should be disseminated and not centralized. The first appeal of Google's uh, enterprise when we saw it was just digitizing millions and millions of books. At Harvard, we have by far the greatest university library in the world. It's enormous, 17 million volumes. And every library wants its holdings digitized for lots of reasons, including preservation. But beyond that, the, it raises the possibility of sharing your intellectual wealth. I think of the Harvard Library as an international asset, something that should be opened up and shared with the general population. So here comes Google. They've got the energy, they've got the technology, they've got the money, and they said, we'll do it for you. Free.
Google did such a fabulous job in creating a vision, not only that a universal digital library could be created, but that it could be done today. The Google engineers are like good engineers everywhere. They just like to think about how do we surmount these challenges. They sort of leave the lawsuit to the, uh, to the lawyers to worry about. Google's a company that believes in its fundamental mission of empowering everyone in this world with all the information they need. Enriched with the right information, people can make better decisions for themselves, their families, and their communities. This world is full of wonderful individuals which have varied needs, from a farmer in Africa, to a mother in India, to a business person in Japan. Everyone needs information in this modern day and age, and Google believes in breaking all the barrier between every individual and the information they seek. When you actually negotiate with Google um, and do so on their turf, you enter a strange world. Uh, a Google office doesn't have chairs like this chair. Uh, the furniture consists of large inflated balls that are colored green or red or yellow. And the young Google engineers are sitting on these. It's a kind of Never Never Land feeling. About 10 years ago, I got a visit from the vice president of Google. And she walked into my office and described a project that Google had in mind, which was to digitize all the books in the Harvard Library. My first thought was, to put it bluntly, that maybe they were smoking something, because I didn't think it was possible. Harvard had been digitizing books from time to time, but they were a very limited in number, and we didn't do many. It was a very expensive and complicated project. I don't remember exactly, but it was several hundred dollars just for a single book. But they had invented a copying station uh, that was a lot cheaper and easier to use, uh, that didn't damage the books, or at least went out of its way not to damage the books. And it seemed to me that it had a lot of plausibility. And so we decided to, uh, to give it a try. Every great library did digitizing, sometimes on a large scale. Our Open Collections program uh, digitized 2.3 million pages. I mean, that's big, but nothing like as big as what uh, Google attempted to do. The sheer ambition of digitizing everything. In the ancient world, at the Library of Alexandria, they copied rolls and tablets and it attempted to copy all that was known. And eventually the library was destroyed by Julius Caesar. And the loss of the Library of Alexandria was an, was an international catastrophe. The Universal Library is being talked about for millennia. There's a kind of a continuity of development and, you know, we mustn't forget the important role that libraries and scholars have always made for, for millennia of copying. And then you see with the development of printing, the multiplicity of texts, the copying of original texts. It was possible to think in the Renaissance that you might be able to amass the whole of published knowledge in a single room or a single institution. Sous mes yeux, j'ai un monument de, de la pensée française, la grande encyclopédie. Les deux maîtres de l'initiative, outre les autres fameux philosophes, ce sont Diderot et d'Alembert. Ils ont voulu euh, ramasser toute la connaissance euh, du moment et le donner à connaître au service de la liberté de penser, au service de la liberté de conscience. Je crois que l'encyclopédie nous parle de ce qui a été un moment de la conscience française au milieu du XVIIIe siècle, à la fin de la monarchie absolue, en préparation de ce mouvement de la pensée qui a conduit à la Révolution française. Then, in the 19th century, you have various suggestions in France and Belgium that you can create a catalogue of everything. What will come next is microfilm. 
And so you start finding huge microfilming projects. And so for us, the Google project was a sort of a net.